Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're talking about marine debris, the problems and issues, as well as what our island communities are doing to combat the problem. We'll visit a grassroots microplastic cleanup effort on Kauai, learn about a fisherman, state, and utility collaboration to turn old fishing nets into usable energy, and talk story with organizations working to promote the efforts we can all take as individuals to help stop marine debris. We start out at the James Campbell National Wildlife Refuge on the northeast side of Oahu, talking to biologist Randy Riggs and NOAA Pacific Islands Marine Debris Regional Coordinator, Mark Manuel. So just describe to me the scale of the marine debris that washes up here at James Campbell Refuge on an ongoing basis. Yeah, definitely. Kahuku Beach here along the uh, James Campbell Refuge is uh, what's called the accumulation point for Oahu. And that's due to uh, it being more exposed to the currents. Right now we're looking at a lot of nice clean sand. We do have, you know, these marine nets behind us, but just a couple of weeks ago, this beach was absolutely covered in plastic marine debris, single use plastics, um, you know, nets from fisheries, uh, plastic fishing floats, you know, things like that. Just a constant influx pretty much at, the, at this point. And then you were telling me that there's marine birds like the albatross that are here that you actually know have ingested plastic. Yeah, so we have an um, albatross colony here that uh, used to exist here historically. In the last few years, we've actually been reestablishing the, um, the colony with uh, translocation. Most of the chicks successfully uh, fledged, and uh, but you know one of them just in the first two weeks they're fed naturally from you know from the adults and just in the first two weeks was fed too much plastic from its parent and you know wasn't able to survive so it's it's really disheartening to you know to see those sorts of things can you just give me kind of an overview what is marine debris? Sure. By mandate, we have this really long definition, but really it's anything to, like a solid man-made or processed material that ends up in our marine environment, our oceans, or on our shorelines. Here in Hawaii, what are some of the marine debris issues that we deal with? As far as wildlife impacts, you have ingestion, um, you know, turtles, fish, birds are mistaking various plastics or other debris items as a food source, so consuming it. Entanglement's another large impact, as you can see behind us, a large derelict net that washes ashore. There's a potential for an endangered Hawaiian monk seal, as well as other critical wildlife to get entangled in it. A big impact too is the cost. It costs our, the state of Hawaii a lot of money to clean up these beaches. There's a lot of nonprofits out there doing great work cleaning our beaches, but that's really a huge cost to everybody involved, as well as the impact to our tourism industry. Debris on our beaches, litter beaches, provide a really poor aesthetic. You're gonna have tourists that don't wanna to come to a beach because it's dirty. We also have the potential for spread of invasive species that hitchhike on debris from throughout the Pacific. Habitat destruction, as you can see behind us again, um, nets can wash ashore, breaking sensitive coral habitat. Hazard to navigation is another big one. There's always the potential for large ships to get um, their props entangled in these nets that are adrift or other debris items. So a lot of impacts, potential impacts, and we definitely see it on a day-to-day -day basis. These beach cleanups are great. You know, seeing the vi visible impacts you can make by removing trash is great. But really, we need to think long-term. That's just a Band-Aid. Re removing debris from the beach is a short-term solution. We need to be very preventive. You know, unfortunately, I think this issue of marine debris is gonna be around for quite a long time. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful within my lifetime that we'll, we'll make a, a definitely a step forward and, and progress for my kids and my grandkids. I truly believe that because we are the ones who created this problem that we need to step up and be the solution or at least part of the solution. Um, and so that, that, that really is what keeps me motivated. Um, we work with a lot of great groups from all levels, federal, state, local, county, nonprofit, even our, our private partners are tremendously supportive of our efforts as a marine debris community here, here in Hawaii and throughout the Pacific. Um, so that's really what motivates me every day. The 
University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're in Honolulu Harbor at Pier 38, talking about the Nets to Energy program with Neil Kanemoto. what the Nuts to Energy program is. Okay, well, you know, for years, for decades, the commercial fishing fleet you see here have been, you know, harvesting the direct uh, fishing nets or ropes or whatever debris they find out at sea. And they've been bringing it here to port. And it's been dumped in that corner over there for the DOT, you know, waste division. They'll transport it, pick it up, transport it to the landfills. But the city and county couldn't deal with that volume, so now everybody's in the dilemma. Hey, what can we do with this? Yeah, um, luckily, a partnership form on Schnitzer Steel and H Power stepped up and they uh, you know, agreed to take on the nets. We have it transported to Schnitzer, they chop it up so uh, H Power can take it and burn it and create energy, turn it into energy for us. The state of Hawaii should be really thankful to Schnitzer Steel for helping us uh, you know, keep these nets out of the landfills and you know, having them power our, our homes. And so what motivates the fishing fleet to bring them in then? If it's, it sounds like it's a lot of work. They do it because uh, it might tangle their, sh their struts or their props or their fishing gear and cost them downtime or damage equipment. And also it's trash, you know, you're going down the street and you see litter, you know, you pick it up. Same in the oceans, their street. They see it, they'll pick it up if they can. The primary fisheries in Honolulu or is the longline fleet. There's 160 permits, which means there can be up to 160 vessels uh, legally fishing. Thousands of miles in every direction, you have our fleets spread out you know, collecting these debris. And keeping in mind, our, our fleet is really very minuscule. The boats are small size, and they're fishing amongst thousands of foreign vessels right outside the 200 mile EZ. So, you know, we're, we're doing our part in collecting. Um, there's bigger boats out there. We don't know if they're collecting the same, you know, debris as we are, um, but we're doing our part. So the boats that I see nearby, those are the typical size boats in our longline fishery? Correct, right. These are the standard size boats, uh, maybe from, you know, 60 to 85 feet or so is the average. The longline fleet usually fishes uh, three weeks average, maybe. Um, if they're going targeting swordfish, then maybe four weeks, five weeks. And the nets, the, these derelict fishing nets that they're collecting, are they from this fleet or are they from lots of different fishing vessels? Uh, we don't know. The nets that we collect and bring back to Hawaii, it's not from Hawaii. It's, we don't even know it's from U.S. fisheries. Uh, it could be from fisheries anywhere in the Pacific or maybe even the Atlantic and the currents bring them around. So we go take a look at some of the nets and see what they look like. Yeah, sure. we got a bunch piled up right now. All right, Neil, tell me what we have going on here. All right, well, here you have a pile of marine debris. And you said it, it's mostly like plastic, like poly, you said polypropylene, polyethylene. Once upon a time, the netting used to be nylon. It's too expensive now, and it also sinks. Some of these fisheries require a floating type of line. So um, a lot of it is prop polyethylene, polypropylene based. Is any of it like a natural fiber? Um, very rarely will you find natural fiber used in the marine applications anymore because it breaks down to the longevity and the strength. It doesn't have the strength or the longevity. So the same thing that causes it to be debris, the fact that it doesn't break down is also kind of why it's useful. Exactly. When my boys have some time, you know, our guys will open this container up and dump it in. And when it gets full, then they'll pick up the phone and ring Schnitzer, they'll send their trucks down take it back to their facility, chop it up, then off to each part goes, and then the bin comes back. Then we'll uh, clean up the bin a bit, so keep it from rusting out, and uh, so the process starts all over again. And can you imagine now, this, these, this pile of nets have dried out for about a, uh, two to three weeks. When it was right off the boat and wet and saturated, I could not be able to even move this pile like this. It, no, it would be impossible. And then you gotta pull it out of the water first. Yeah, yep. 
Is this a lot or is this like a typical amount? Um, it, it just depends, you know, there's sometimes when the fishermen are fishing in areas that they don't have, they don't get encountered debris, so this area will be vacant for a while and all of a sudden, you know, in a week's time it can be full. It, it just depends on how much fishing effort and where and if there's debris around, is, around the area that they're fishing. And then I noticed that this is different and where did yeah. this guy come well, from? Uh, this is also um, stuff that is uh, disposed in the bin, and this is the main line from the long line fleet. And they're responsible fishermen, they'll bring it back. It doesn't get dumped at sea, they'll bring it back. As you can see, it'll get, uh, it'll also make its way to um, Schnitzer and then ultimately Kovatna each power plant. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back. We're taking marine debris out of the sand with the Friends of Kamalani Group at Lidgate Park on Kauai. Every Saturday morning, uh, and this has been for many years now, since I would say 1994, uh, a group of volunteers, a core group, has come at 8.30 to work for about two hours cleaning uh, the, the pond area, the Lidgate Beach area that is very uh, highly frequented by visitors. So can you explain to me a little bit about the idea behind the process? Well, the stuff floats. That's its nature. The sand sinks. We like the sand. We don't like the floaty stuff. So why not float it, separate what we want from what we don't want. We have tried raking it, but because this material is so tiny, it goes right through the teeth of the rake. And then we tried screening it with a quarter inch screen, and it's so tiny it goes right through the quarter inch screen. And then we tried screening it with window screen, and we're going, this sucks. So with enough muscle and enough community participation, we can clear a lot of square feet of beach, square yards of beach, get it clean, because it's just laying there on the surface if your timing is right. So you guys are using density and gravity to help you clean the beach? Yeah. And so this is a system that you guys yeah. have developed yourself yeah. over time? Yeah. So this is shade cloth from a local hardware store. You can buy it in rolls uh, 100 feet long for a small amount of money. Uh -huh. The uh, These are, are the 55 gallon drums that you can find uh, from medical supplies cut in half. A little uh, rope to uh, give you a grab handle. And uh, pretty basic. My husband, um, John Lidgate, who, uh, whose grandfather they named the park after, uh, he felt from the beginning when we moved here that it was his honorable duty to take care of the park that bore his name so as to keep the name clean <laughs> in, in that sense of the word. And plus he loved the ocean. I mean, he recently died, I have to add here. Uh, he loved the ocean, he loved the beach, so it, it was a natural for him to take this up as, as his um, special project. And we enjoy it, and it's not like it's all dreary work, you know, it's also the little social club afterwards. We bring coffee, we sit, we have a chat, and of course we can go in the water or use the multi-purpose pass that we meanwhile have because the park has expen expanded uh, in a big way. 
Have you noticed a change in the plastics over time since you've been taking I, care? Yeah, I would say that overall there is more plastic coming in. I, I, would, I couldn't put a, a number to it like 10 times as much as in 94 or so. There was always some plastic, yeah. But yeah, definitely more plastic. Still seemed to be manageable while the pieces were relatively big. But now with that kind of tiny stuff, who wants to, to squat there and pick that out bit by bit? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, that has definitely become worse. And I'm also thinking, you know, the smaller, the more likely that even tiny fish can swallow it and more and more gets in the food chain. Yeah. It's amazing even looking at the sand that's been cleaned. You can still see the plastic yeah, in it. Yeah. It's, it's a step forward, it's not perfect, but it's, it's something. Next, we're at Kapi'olone Park on Oahu, talking to surf rider and Kokua Foundation leaders about what we can all do to help clean up and prevent marine debris. To be very honest, we're way past the point of no return. I mean, the, the canary in the ocean died a long time ago. There could be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. Those types of stats are really mounting. And so we need some, we need the bottom up work that we're doing as our daily behavior change, but we also need the policy changes that are going to maybe take away some of the things from us that are causing the destruction in the oceans as well. And Doria, why do you think it's hard for people um, to make those personal choices on a daily basis? Well, I think all of us were born into a consumer culture, and so we're, we are born inheriting a culture that is very dependent on throwing things away and single use. And so we're not really taught um, how to live in a sustainable way, how to live in alignment with our values to protect the earth. And every generation throughout history has created a lot of changes in their culture, and so we see plastic and waste and waste reduction as a big way that um, our younger generations can do that. Any single use is not ideal, so that even if it's compostable, it's still um, a big waste of resources if you're only using it one time. And so we really want to bring people back to um, remember that reusing things are easy and we all use reusables at home every day. So it's not that hard to switch and start remembering to do those things outside of the home as well. And what are some of the things that you're working on for the future of Hawaii? I think, I mean, within the, the marine debris realm, we're, we're really working on the legislative level, we're working really hard to try and get rid of polystyrene foam. I think that, as, as DeRay mentioned, it's so pervasive in our society here, and it's, it's one of the biggest things that we find on the beaches. So we're working both at the state level. The Big Island and Maui counties both just passed polystyrene foam bans. So the, the movement has already begun, and the understanding of why we're doing that movement is also very much intact. So transitioning now to the most populous island in Oahu is, is a huge step, or even doing it at the state level where it can spread across. But let's also give ourselves credit. You know, we finally closed the loopholes in the, in the plastic bag ban on, in Oahu, and now are a state that's, that's completely plastic bag free at the checkout counters. And something that we're working on is consistently educating school children um, of all ages, as well as consulting businesses and event organizers to help restaurants and events go plastic free because that's where a large plastic footprint exists for our islands. And so constantly building those bridges and creating partnerships so we can maximize reduction of um, plastic at the source. The rapid expansion of what we've seen in marine debris has been hugely impactful to me. Is in four years of working for this organization, exponentially each year, what we're seeing on the beaches where there's places where you don't see sand or lava rock anymore because there's so much plastic covering it. Next, we're learning about Surf Riders Ocean Friendly Restaurant Program with Stuart Coleman and how to integrate sustainability into our culture with Pauline Sato from Malama Learning Center. Sometimes people saying like, oh, why are you doing all this taking away bags and, you know, styrofoam? Like, we, I, we've always done it this way. And it's like, I want to remind people, like, your grandparents did not do it this way. You know, wartime in Hawaii, you saved everything. And up until the modern era where we created this throwaway culture, you didn't throw away valuable materials. The idea of a single-use anything is ridiculous. 
You know, it's a finite planet with limited resources and we have to conserve those. So it's always like, listen to what your grandmother said. You know, we gotta go back to that <laughs> time of just, you know, being careful with what you have and, and not, you know, using what you don't need. And so the Ocean Friendly Restaurants Program developed a set of 10 criteria to, you know, reduce single-use plastic waste um, like styrofoam and like utensils, single-use plastic utensils, cups, bottles, plates. Um, so all restaurants like this one behind us, you know, will use reusable tableware um, on site. And it just makes a huge difference because restaurants produce some of the most plastic than any other source. We found when we started off this program, it's just a win-win-win because the customers love it. They're looking for restaurants that don't have a lot of waste and tourists especially because they come from other places where they don't have styrofoam and all these plastic bags. And so that was really interesting to see that you know locals and tourists alike love the program. And then the restaurants loved it because we're generating a lot of business for them. And then we have happy hour parties, you know, once a month we go give love back to the restaurants and we're getting 50 to 70 people at each one. And they're like, wow, this is exactly <laughs> the kind of people we want here, you know, and they're young and they're engaged and they're, you know, just committed to, to helping the environment. You know, it's also just good for the, the environment itself and the neighborhood and the community. It's a lot of community engagement. So it's been great. We started in Earth Day 2016 and within a year and a half, we've certified 140 restaurants. Wow, yeah. and those are primarily on Oahu? Uh, no, all over Hawaii. And based on the success, it started with Surfrider in San Diego, but based on the success in Hawaii, they decided to roll it out nationwide. And they can go to the Ocean Friendly Restaurant website to learn about becoming certified or finding restaurants in their area that are participating. Yeah, exactly. So OceanFriendlyRestaurantsHawaii.org has a whole list and it does it by island, by shore, so it's super easy. And <laughs> well, we're a, a small nonprofit environmental education organization based in Kapolei that works um, primarily on the west side of the island or leeward coast. I like to say from Waipahu to Waianae, uh, working with students, teachers, families, community members to help them learn how to take care or malama their, um, their land as well as themselves as, as a lifestyle, as a way of being. In Hawaii, we're proud of our environment, we're proud of the ocean, how beautiful it is. Uh, but that pride only goes so far. We have to do something about it. We have to make sure that we are part of the um, keeping places beautiful and understanding that every one of us has an impact, whether it's positive or negative or both, but we should be aware of it and, and try our best to do something personally as well as share it with others and, you know, kids, tell their parents because I you know parents will be like, okay, I get it, don't pollute. Um, but that's important, you know, that's what it's gonna take all of us to make that difference. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant.